Good morning. It is good to see everyone here in the sanctuary and online. Welcome to this Sunday uh, worship. A couple things before we get going. A reminder about our items that we are collecting for the food pantry. Those items are um, listed in the bulletin that was sent around by email or on the website. And you can see that when you come in in the narthex there, there's boxes that you can drop off the items of food that we are collecting. And um, if you aren't able to get to the store, or don't have those items in your pantry, the food pantry will gladly take cash donations. So you can either give cash and we'll forward that along or to electronically or to write a check, just put May food items on there and then we'll forward all that money to the food pantry as well. So we need all that turned in by May 24th. And these are items that have been specifically asked for us to collect. So we need to fulfill our responsibility and get those items in. And then also a reminder that uh, the month of May is our 1%, a chance where we are able to say yes to God in raising 1%. Our budget uh, that the board passed early in May is um, just about 400000 for our mission in ministries of the church. And so 1% of that is about $4,000. And we're hoping to raise that by your extra giving to say, yes, Lord, here I am, both financially and or in person to help get done what needs to be done in this community. So when you give that offering, just put 1% in the memo section so that we know to attribute that there. And then we're going to take all of that, plus the 4,600 raised from the rummage sale, and use that money specifically for mission and outreach this year. So we also want you to tell us what um, charities or outreach groups uh, that you would like this money to be used for. And again, then it's our hope that we will be able to send this money, different amounts to these different organizations um, and and to be able to support them. Because as a community faith, we have different interests and we want to be able to uh, reach out in different ways to help different people in need. So, a lot going on, and uh, we hope to start some of our Sunday school uh, in a couple of weeks. So, we have some people volunteering for that, which is very good. If you're interested in that as well, uh, please see myself or Pastor Margo or um, Hannah or Daniel. So, a lot going on, a lot to be aware of, and let's take a moment to be in prayer, and then we're going to sing a song that's called My Feet. My feet are on the rock. I almost said my feet is on the rock, but it's my feet are on the rock. Lord Jesus, thank you for helping us with our uh, grammar and worshiping you and being here. Lord, we come to you just as we are, ready or not. And we know that your sweet grace and mercy loves us and you welcome us here. So Lord, we're going to praise you and open our minds and hearts to what you have for us today. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. May the Lord bless this reading. Okay, my friends, let's turn in our Bibles now to 
um, a little bit further into the New Testament to Acts. So we'll have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And we're going to be in chapter 3. And just to understand what Acts is, Acts was um, Acts is commonly referred to as Luke Acts because the gospel writer of Luke also wrote Acts. And so as we read Luke, the gospel of Luke, it comes, it flows into Acts. Now, whereas Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John focus on the ministries of Jesus, Acts uh, focuses on the post-Easter church and the post-resurrection of Jesus Christ, but specifically the, the role of the apostles and disciples in furthering the church. And so with Acts, we get some insight into the challenges um, that the early Christians had in being church, in coming together, in learning how to worship and struggle and, 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 and teach and evangelize and spread the good news and so forth. So when we begin here in Acts 3, it is immediately following the story of Pentecost or when the Holy Spirit comes upon um, the early people of church in Acts chapter 2. And so there was a great crowd that had gathered in the, with Pentecost, and we actually celebrate Pentecost next Sunday on the 23rd. And Pastor Margo is going to be preaching on, on, about Pentecost and so we, so for, for the disciples, they're there, there's a great crowd around. So Peter and John are now going to be on their way to the temple for evening prayers. And they're going to come across a guy who's been uh, lame since birth. And we're going to read about this encounter. And as we hear it, you may see some similarities in the healing story that Hannah read from uh, the Gospel of Mark. So Acts chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 8, then I'm going to skip to verses 16 through 21. So what happens is after chapter 8, um, it continues on where Peter begins addressing the crowd and helping them understand what Jesus Christ did and how Jesus comes from, um, has been prophesied and, and so forth. We're going to, we'll go 16 through 21. All right, so Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in, and people would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. So he's asking them for handouts, for money. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So we go to verse 16. Peter says, to this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah anointed, appointed for you, and that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. So as we read this scripture and hear this, I love the phrase that Peter and John, when looking at him, Peter says to him, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. 
I don't have any silver and gold. I don't have any money in my pocket. There's no, there's no credit card to swipe. But what I have, I give you. And so we look at this, where the person was there, and we see this guy who's ready to receive. He's, he's been laid. He has no way to make an income or to be taken care of for himself. So he goes to the temple. He knows that as the good Jewish folks go to the temple to pray, those who are going there, um, because they're devout, they also know that giving alms or helping the poor is also one of their requirements. So he knows that if they're going to go there to pray, they're probably also going to give him some money, some resources, some alms. He was there looking for something, wasn't he? And then interestingly enough, Peter's like, hey, look, look at me, look at me, look at us. And he looked at them, expecting to receive. So it just makes me think, what are we looking for? Like, what are we looking for? I I feel like for the last year and a half, we've been looking for something, looking for a way out, looking for a way to be safe, looking for a way to, you know, we always talked about getting back to normal, looking for something in our lives that was going to settle this internal anxiousness and fear and isolation that's been happening. And so we see in the Gospel of Mark, where again, there was a man crippled, paralytic since birth. Now, did you notice anything about that story when Hannah read it, about this miracle healing story? What did it say about the man's faith? Ah, trick question. It said nothing about his faith. It doesn't even say he had faith. A little faith, a lot of faith, nothing. His friends believed in this name of Jesus, this Jesus who could heal, that was healing. And Mark, in writing his gospel, wants us to know who the Messiah is and that the Messiah, this change agent of God, God who is incarnate here on this earth, has power over the the water, the air, the, the natural weather, but also power over the demons and to heal the physical body, power over everything and also that can forgive sins. And so Jesus sees the faith of his friends and says to him, your sins are forgiven. In other words, you are healed, you have received salvation. He saw the faith of his friends. Now this causes us to think a little bit because for so long and sometimes based on where you've maybe grown up or what you've heard, it's you know always, we hear about this faith or the Jesus or God only works in certain ways and what we see here is this man's healed, never, we're never told that he even asked for it. His friends were gonna do anything they could, tore apart the, part the roof to lower him in. And see, this is where sometimes we get caught up as Christians. You know, this whole thing you think about yourself, like am I worthy enough of God's grace? Am I worthy enough of God's love? Am I even really... Why should I even go to church? I've kind of messed things up or I've been away from God for so many years. God's still seeking you. Jesus is the seeking savior, looking, seeking those who are broken to bring restoration and healing to you. And then because there was question about what he could do, to prove that the healing, that the salvation had come, he says, take up your mat, get up and walk. And so for the paralytic, he's able to get up and walk. And all the people are amazed. And so here we have again, then in Acts, Jesus has already ascended into heaven. The resurrection has happened. Jesus has been there. He's now ascended into heaven and as he did in the Great Commission, Jesus sends out the apostles to continue the work of Jesus Christ, to continue the mission. And so we have to see the story as the post-Easter church. What are we to do? Why well, Acts teaches us that we are to trust, that we are being invited and asked to go on this journey that begins in trust, that begins in faith, and then we are to go out and steward this good news of Jesus Christ to tell, to heal, Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, am I supposed to heal someone? 
That's a pretty big order. It might take a lot of faith, right? Am I, are, am I ready for that? Well, Peter makes it clear that it's not he that heals or John that heals, but it is Jesus Christ who heals. And that's why he says, in the name of Jesus. But what are you looking for? And so in the story of Acts, we can really see ourselves in two different ways or two different identities. Perhaps you're the person that is broken, needing healing. Or maybe we're the the apostles, we're the church. What are we doing to bring healing into the world, into the community? Now, generally, in the Bible, where there is a healing, a physical healing story, it is... There's more going on than to take it just literally. There's lots of other symbolisms that happen here and get involved. So what we see here is that the disciples, at the end of chapter 2, it really gets into this um, almost Pollyanna version of what the early church and disciples were like. Because it talks about how the disciples would put everything, their, the, their money into a, a community pot and they would share bread together and they would pray and so forth. I mean, it sounds really wonderful. But the reality is they're asked to go out into the world. And what we have to see is that the way of prayer, the way of living a life of mission, of being a, a follower of Christ, is to directly go through misery, to engage with those who are in need. In other words, it would be nice if in this moment here, in this hour, I think there's even a hymn, right? Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Da, 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 da. Right? Well, man, wouldn't that be great if like that's what your life was like all day long? So here's the disciples, the apostles, they're going to church to pray and what happens? They run into the reality of a broken yet whole world, a broken world that God has made, but still a wonderful world. And here's this man looking for something. And they have a choice. What do they do? Now, they didn't have all the resources to cure all what was going on. But they said, I have something And we see this as something more valuable. It's something we all have. We all have the name of Jesus in which we can see the people sitting at the gate of our church, at the gate of our community, somebody who is sitting there looking for something. And that something could be you. You could be looking for something. I am always looking for something. I'm looking for the next, you know, social media post that will make me feel a little bit better. Right? That's why we scroll mindlessly through there. I'm looking for the next podcast that will somehow give me this next great insight into something. And as we talked about before, we're looking for something, but the answer is always Jesus. It comes back to Jesus. What are you looking for? So internally, we have to, as we look, look at ourselves and inside, what is going on? What am I resistant to? What am I rebelling against? What am I pushing away from me? What do I feel being nudged inside me by the Holy Spirit that I'm just not quite ready to embrace yet? Maybe because it might cause me to change or have to change or to stop doing something that I've always done. Even if that seems to make me feel better, but in the long run really doesn't bring me that peace that I'm looking for. And so we have this seeking Savior that's out there. And we as the church, the post-Easter church, this healing story helps us see that we are to engage in this world, that we are to follow, that we are to trust, that we are to um, have faith as we go about it. And then we're gonna figure some things out. Now, what the healing story does, it sets up for Peter's address to those listeners for him to bring them the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. And then he says, what you need to do right now, because you weren't really understanding it before, is you need to repent. 
you need to repent and receive this Holy Spirit so this time of refreshing will come upon you. Isn't that a nice word? Like if you say, I'd like to be refreshed or I feel refreshed, that is a good word. It, it invokes a good feeling, doesn't it? Because you know when you are refreshed that you feel invigorated, different, lively, changed. So what do we have to do to be refreshed? So in your daily habits, in your daily disciplines, as you go throughout the week, what are you doing daily that helps you find what you are looking for? Are you repenting? Are you willing to say, Lord, I am sorry for doing this, this, and this. It should not matter what the other people did. You're only dealing with your actions. Because if we're not saying, I'm sorry, or we're not repenting on a daily basis, this has something to say about your own spiritual life, your relationship. And so that's something to think about that. What am I willing to do? So as we go through this story, this man fixed his attention on them, right? Because Peter says, look at me. Have you ever had to have a conversation with a teenager? Right? Like I said, have you ever tried to have a conversation with a teenager? It can be very difficult sometimes. And teenagers, I know, it's just, it is what it is, right? Look at me. Not at the phone, but look at me. This, this divine, personal interaction so that this person would know that what was happening was a result of the goodness of Jesus Christ flowing into them. He expected to receive something. We go through life looking for things, expecting to receive, expecting to feel better, wanting the world to be different. And sometimes we look to, to different places to, to cure, to, to change the culture so that it makes it easier for us. I would strongly encourage you to not be a consumer when it comes to your religious beliefs, your place of worship. You can be a consumer where you choose to eat. You can be a consumer what gym membership you choose to have. But your relationship with Jesus Christ and your call to follow is based on a gift of grace that is given to you. And God leads you. And even in all the goodness of the church, the church is going to be asked to step directly into the line of the misery that's out there in the world so that we as the church are willing to come alongside those who are suffering, to come alongside those in their journey, in their good times and in their bad times. And in doing so, we are changed on the inside. Only true change happens from the inside out. We can't look to the legislature to legislate moralities. Our change comes from the inside out in what we do. It's our role as the post-Easter church to continue what happened years ago that what we read about in Acts so that we can go out and tell the good news that we can invite others to be on this quest of, of discipleship. And then we do so learning as we go, making mistakes, forgetting things, having to forgive each other and repent. The reason we have most of the New Testament, the epistles, the letters to the churches, is because the early church people were fighting and arguing with each other, right? We're not a whole lot different. We disagree with each other. But what the disciples, what the early apostles said is, 
we may not have everything. This church may not have everything. The church down the road may not have everything. But what we all have in common is the name of Jesus to go out and heal. And so I believe that in the name of Jesus, through the name of Jesus, we can go out and heal. Now, Acts has plenty of stories about trying to wield the power of the Holy Spirit or by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do that. But you can every time in faith say, can I pray for you in the name of Jesus? I'm going to bless you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to do this for you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to do this because Jesus has asked us to do And in doing so, we continue to provide a blessing. We look at financial um, success in this world as as a physical blessing of God. Whereas the Bible constantly looks at the joy of life. So as as a church ministry, we can't be just about providing money to people. And we talked about that. We're gonna do that. We wanna provide resources out in there. But what we also have as a church And as individuals have to do, we also have to be in prayer. We have to come alongside and listen. We have to come alongside and help. We have to come alongside and do. We have to come alongside and pray. So that if a person repents, they have received healing. You experience healing when you are in church or you are watching from home and you are repenting, you are praying. You're letting the work of salvation and the cross work inside you. And it's a healing that can happen every day that changes who you are and what you're able to do so that you can feel confident to come alongside somebody and say, I'd like to help you in the name of Jesus. So my friends, what are we looking for What are you looking for? In this world, in this time of restlessness, let's come back to this peace of God that we receive, the joy that we receive through Jesus, and let's be church together, one day at a time, one week at a time, one Sunday at a time, all right? Amen.